I'm a map maker. Uh, I'm mapping out, uh, and have been for 47 years, so it's more than 40, uh, mapping the dynamics uh, and structure of adaptive power and intelligence in human systems. Uh, that's kind of highfalutin. Uh, but basically, what it means is that we're trying to understand how uh, individuals learn, how uh, primary groups learn, or uh, uh, people who know each other well and can support each other and speak frankly to each other and tolerate each other's idiosyncrasies, how, how they learn together, how organizations learn, how communities learn, how societies learn, how civilization learns and how our species learns. One of the hugely limiting ways we approach learning is to focus only on individuals. The reality is you can't understand what individuals can learn without understanding what a civilization has learned and how that learning has been encoded and embodied in the cultural resources and assets that are then made available to individuals to access and of course what kind of cultural resource and access capacities have been developed in human beings so that they're able to search out and discern those cultural resources and assets that are worth paying attention to and learning from. Now, the only way that human beings or any life form can learn uh, uh, is by attending to signals or to feedback uh, that indicate that there's something uh, important to be attended to here. There is a lesson embedded in uh, uh, your being in a particular place, the circumstance, uh, and the path that you've been on, and the challenges that are coming at you. Now, uh, the, uh, there are so many different uh, uh, aspects to the challenge of separating out signals from noise and understanding that it's not so much the separating out of signals it's the capacity for understanding what something means. And then when we talk about signals and noise, essentially what we're talking about is the difference between things that are meaningful and things that uh, are not yet meaningful. That's the noise part. Uh, there are you know, mathematical and physical ways of amplifying signals so that you can uh, discern uh, uh, signals that would otherwise be buried in noise uh, through a very simple process of signal averaging. The noise, if it is really random, cancels itself out, whereas the signal will amplify itself, becomes visible. With, in a simple physical way, all it takes is about 12 passes, and you can see the signal really clearly. But that's not the kind of signal, I think, that is really important for human learning. That's uh, really important for some technical aspects of, of learning. But more importantly is that we need to understand what make something meaningful and how do we identify that meaning and how do we search it out and what's the difference between things that are meaningful or full of meaning and things that are meaningless or simply have less meaning attached to them uh, and that story takes some investigation but essentially the story of meaning and meaning making is the same for all life and that is it's fundamentally connected to what life does and that is to match capacities to the challenges that exist in the niche or habitat. So that learning, uh, uh, which is fundamentally this process of uh, matching capacity uh, to the challenges in the environment, is characteristic of all life and things will be more or less meaningful depending on whether or not the match that is being created by the species, by the individual, by the civilization, by the organization, does it match the most significant adaptive challenges in the environment? That's the critical test. That word adaptive uh, comes from uh, compound, uh, uh, Latin words ad, which means to, and aptar, which means to fit. When something is adapting, you're matching something to something, capacity to challenge. And you could spend a long time investigating how that process unfolds, and the difference between genetic processes that create a match between not just genes but the whole gene scape that is to say the whole species and the action scape or the niche and habitat in which that species is making its way so life is a lot more complicated in terms of genetic learning and programming than we typically make out then there's the kind of learning that happens uh, uh, for 
animals with enough sophistication that can support individual learning, where as a result of your life experience, you're drawing lessons out as best you can and then trying to apply those lessons in your life situation. And that can work well or it can work really badly because that's the source of a great many neuroses and uh, uh, psychoses and mm, poor behavior. Learning from experience isn't necessarily an adaptive thing. You're adapting to something, but what we're adapting to can often be very narrow and not well-founded. Then there's the kind of learning that happens just by virtue of living in a culture or an environment where we're programmed unconsciously as a result of engaging <coughs> with a civilization or a society. Most learning happens subconsciously. We're not aware that it's happening, but it's there, and it isn't necessarily adaptive either. In fact, one of the great lessons of history is that most civilizations fail. They collapse at some point. Our civilization is getting very close to collapsing. We're on a breakdown path, and we cannot uh, maintain our existing civilization on its current trajectory. It will collapse. There's no other way forward unless we change course. That's a subject for another TED Talk, but it's a really important <laughs> aspect of signals and noise. If you cannot discern a potentially fatal signal uh, uh, in the context, then your capacity for intelligent decision making and action is obviously very constrained. I just want to share a couple of, of aspects of the learning process that uh, makes the business of learning a bit more noisy than one might assume it could be. That is to say, makes it difficult for us to develop the feedback loops that are essential for understanding what to pay attention to. One of the things that uh, is very uh, you know, fundamentally important, you've all heard the expression, I'm sure, knowledge is power. And this is something you hear often, especially in a school context when we're trying to get kids to acquire more knowledge, we can test them on, and then they can forget it and move on to other things that are far more important. <laughs> but uh, I worked for the Calgary Board of Education, running a research and development team from 1970 to 1983, uh, where uh, uh, my hunting license was to figure out how do we equip kids with a capacity for responsible autonomy, to equip them for the ability to direct their own life learning beyond the boundaries of convention, where you couldn't rely on routine uh, to tell you what to do and how to do it. Uh, and in order to uh, begin that process of designing pilot programs uh, and collect the research, we need to understand more about how <coughs> human beings develop the capacity to do things that have never been done before where they cannot rely on external direction and control. That led to a search across different fields of endeavor. We started with uh, military strategy and field command and with civil engineering. The difference between military engineering and civil engineering is that civil engineering happens uh, in a non-military context. So you've got military or non-military. That's essential. But when you're building something that is brand new and you can't go on precedent, you don't know what the failure dynamics is going to be for that bridge uh, or that pillar or that strut. How do you know? How do you figure out how it's likely to fail? And how do you keep it from failing? Mm -hmm. So there's, if you, if you line up uh, military strategy with engineering and then with entrepreneurial business and then with epidemiology and disease prevention and then a variety of other fields of endeavor, you can start to see the patterns, consistency across fields of endeavor. You can see the characteristics of adaptive power and intelligence coming through very clearly. Unfortunately, the story isn't simple because the structure of adaptive power and intelligence looks something like that. There's at least six dimensions to it, uh, or five dimensions and an integrative process. But I'll list them off just basically and then explain a simple implication of this. One of the dimensions is, of course, the intelligence dimension, your capacity for sensing, detecting, interpreting, projecting external context and internal context and environment and where things may, might be headed. The intelligence dimension is where we have accumulate our knowledge. So sense, detect, interpret, and project. So it's not just about detecting that there's a signal there. The important thing is how do you interpret the signal? And the reality is that the signal interpretation is going to be a product of how much you've accumulated to that point in your capacity to interpret whatever you've seen. You can't separate out 
the interpretive capacities of individuals and the signals that they're surrounded with. And the reality is that our civilization is awash with signals that there are very few people who are prepared to actually interpret. And this is a huge problem. And it always also created a society where the disciplines that are required for accurate interpretation of signals are undervalued. And we're living in a time when there's a kind of uh, rampant subjectivity uh, uh, or postmodern approach to uh, uh, the uh, development of understanding uh, where uh, everyone gets to choose their own realities. Uh, so the alternative facts, uh, as we've seen a lot of. Uh, but uh, that intelligence dimension is critically important, but it's not the only dimension. You have to have an operational dimension. Having all the intelligence in the world doesn't do you any good if you can't do anything with it. Then you have to have an intention dimension. Intention dimension is your capacity to create situational uh, uh, purposes and objectives uh, based on your intelligence and your operational capability. But that uh, has to be then tied to an authorizational dimension uh, where uh, your situational intentions are part of the bigger picture. All of you have to have some higher level of oversight to be able to figure out how to get home tonight. Because you have an immediate situation that you're in here uh, that uh, is, uh, you're, you're taking in uh, and you're operating on the basis of an intention to be here, but that that intention is part of a whole constellation of intentions that make up your life journey at this point. And that that's part of your authorization. But there's one dimension above that, and that's the transcendent dimension, which doesn't necessarily mean uh, uh, religion, although religion is reaching for this dimension. That transcendent dimension is the dimension of autonomous power that connects the entity or the agency to the broader context of creation, the cosmos, uh, whatever it is out there in the universe that made it possible for us to be here. I'm often asked in our programs, do you believe in God? And my answer is always the same. If you mean God the creator, no. If you mean God the creating, yes. God the creating is different because I don't have to completely eliminate my critical thinking capacity to believe that there is something about the universe that makes life and intelligence possible. That's empirical. We're here. We can see that. Our challenge, my challenge, our challenge is to try to figure out what this God the creating is up to and how can we be helpful and less destructive. That's our challenge. And that you need then a adaptive learning capacity to be able to integrate these different dimensions together effectively. Now here's a simple application. If you provide for young people all of the necessary direction to do something, all of the necessary skill coach to do something, all of the necessary resources to do something, and all of the necessary motivation to do it, what's left for them? What's left for them? Nothing but the doing and having done, they will not have learned how to do. So this is what we focused on for the 13 years I was engaged with the Calgary Board, trying to figure out the core of agency. What is it that equips human beings to take responsibility for their own life learning and for their own processes of becoming as a human being? It's more appropriate really to think of ourselves as not just human beings, but human becomings. Because humanity is not a finished product. We are a work in progress. And we're a long way away from being anything like a finished product. But it's critically important that we understand something about how we have been searching and reaching for our potential as a species. Uh, and to learn the lessons, what's worked, what hasn't worked very well, I want to just offer one more quick perspective. Consciousness is like the beam of a flashlight. It's focused. We can't take in everything at once. We have to swing our attention around to different parts of the environment. Okay? And there's always more going on inside and outside than we can possibly pay attention to. This should raise some immediate questions in your mind. How do we know that we're paying attention to the most significant things? And the answer is because our culture and programming tells us what we should be paying attention to in different circumstances. And that we all have this operational level of attention, uh, uh, sort of a first order oversight and control. 
but there is a higher order oversight and control that's attending to our first order oversight and control that tells us that this is what we should be paying attention to, this is how long we should be paying attention to, this is how much of our life resources we should be putting into it. This is why it's important. Here's who you should take into account when you're doing these things, and here's who you can forget, and here's who you might think about having to kill or that they might have, you know, want to be killing you. All of that's kind of tied up in this level of oversight and control. Now, when you start actually digging into the structure of these higher levels of oversight and control, it's our lack of understanding of how to structure these higher levels of oversight and control that creates most of the problems that we encounter in the world. This is what's behind the Manchester bombings. This is behind ISIS. It's behind uh, uh, President Donald Trump. It's, it's behind our climate denial or inability to acknowledge that we are changing the climate. It's the way we construct and verify that we are attending to the right things. And the logic that we're using to determine whether or not we're doing that well is all tied up in the disciplines and the processes here. We can investigate those. And we've been doing that now for so it's about 47 years. What does this actually look like? And then we realize that we actually need one higher order of oversight and control. It's not an infinite regress. It's not like a hall of mirrors where it just keeps going because each order is doing something different and it's a f informed by different disciplines. So that what we need to be attending to in terms of the signals is to ask the question if we're, we're searching for something that's meaningful. The most meaningful thing in my view from a human learning ecology perspective is how to construct this third order oversight and control in such a way that it provides us with the capacity for detection and prevention, uh, uh, or detection, correction, anticipation, and prevention of ignorance and error that causes most of the waste, suffering, and injustice in the world. This is doable, but only if we look. You will not find the signals if you're not looking. You will not understand them if you're not equipped to understand. And I'm seven, six, five, four, <laughs> three, two, I see the signal. <laughs>